So the reason all of you are here uh, is obviously to learn more about fundamentals and how to actually use fundamentals to swing trade, right? Specifically to swing trade successfully. By swing trading successfully, successfully is such a vague uh, word because success means different things to different people. But what I mean by trading successfully, I mean that at the end of the month, at the end of the at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, you are profitable. If you have a position and your position wins, because you you everyone experiences losing positions, but by successful, I mean that if your position wins or actually goes into profit, you're able to make a minimum of 100 pips in terms of profits. That is what I mean by swing trading successfully, right? So in today's uh, webinar, I'll be teaching you guys that. And what I'll be teaching you, unfortunately, it's not a secret. If maybe some of you guys thought I had a secret that I was going to share, unfortunately, it's not a secret. It's just work that most retail traders, I'm also a retail trader, but I'll just refer for the purpose of this of this webinar, I'll just refer as retail traders. But it's just some of the work that most retail traders are unwilling to do. So it's not a secret. And all I ask of you guys is, of course, to take notes if you can and mostly to allow what I'll teach you guys to actually sink in. And the reason I ask of you guys to actually allow what I will teach you to sink in, it is because most people make the mistake of actually thinking that the objective or the purpose of learning something is to know something. But the real objective or purpose of learning something is mastery, right? And if, you do, if you're not sure about what mastery actually is, Mastery, like I have it on the screen there, it is effortless execution. So whenever you're learning something, the, the goal or the objective should be for you to get to a point where you can effortlessly execute that task, whatever it may be. So in this case, we're talking about fundamentals and swing trading. It is about mastery of that task. Tying your shoelaces, you have mastery of what? Of that specific task. Why? Because you don't think much. You don't have to use much brain power for you to actually tie your shoelaces. You can do it even walking. You, you look down, you see that one of your shoelaces have been undone. You just tie them real quick and then you get going. So you don't have to think about it, about it that much. So that is what I mean by mastery. And that is why, like I said, I'm asking you guys that if you can take notes, do take notes, but also allow what I'm going to teach you guys today to actually sink in, right? So if you have not mastered it, to me, you have not learned it. If you still have to look it up, if someone asked you something, chances are you have not yet learned it, right? So I just wanted to clear that up. And then, of course, we are now going to get started with understanding the power and simplicity of fundamentals, right? So before I actually dive deeper into that, I'll just give you a brief summary of my story in terms of how I actually <clears throat> came across uh, fundamentals because I've, I've explained previously that I started trading around 2016, 17, but how did I actually come across fundamentals or actually come to the realization of the power and simplicity of fundamentals? So, it was back around 2017, just to give you an idea of, 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 of when this was. And uh, it was on a Friday. I was about to trade NFP, right? So I was still early in my trading days, but of course I had read about NFP. And then when I knew that it was happening on that specific Friday, I jumped straight onto my best friend, which was Google at that point. I did a bit of, I won't say research, but I just a quick search on what NFP was. Then I went straight to Forex Factory at the time because I was using Forex, Fac Forex Factory. When I went on to the actual, I saw that it was a red folder event, which meant which meant high volatility because that's all I knew at that point. And then when I clicked on the on the on the folder, it showed me well. It explained that if the figure comes out greater than what is expected, that will be positive for the dollar. So the U.S. dollar should go higher. If the figure comes below what is expected then the US dollar should do what? Should go lower, right? And of course, at that point, I was like, okay, it's simple, it's easy. Went straight on to YouTube, best strategy for trading fundamentals. I came across a very short video. I wasn't looking for a very long video. Short video, watch that real quick. 
And then, of course, I was at that point ready to trade fundamentals. So a few minutes before the news release, applying what I had learned from the video I had watched on YouTube, I actually placed a buy stop above price, a sell stop below the price. I can't remember the name of the actual, of the actual strategy. And then I waited for the actual news release. So buy stop above, above price, sell stop below the price. And then when the news broke out, uh, it was negative for the dollar because the numbers were below what was expected. Then the dollar shot lower in this, in that, in that particular instance, I was trading Euro US, I was trading um, USD JPY. So it shot lower. And then immediately as I closed my buy stop, because that is what, that is what, the, that was the instruction I had gotten from the video that once it triggers one of the orders, you close the other. So it triggered my sell stop. I did what? I closed my buy stop. A couple of seconds later, it shot back up. Then of course it wiped out my account. And that's how quickly I realized the power of fundamentals, right? And unfortunately, uh, my account was gone. I had lost my account at that point, but I also came to the decision that fundamentals do not work and that it, at that point, it is useless for me to do what? To focus on fundamentals, I'll continue learning technicals. But it was unfortunately a decision or a conclusion that I had came to that would actually cost me four years of my trading career, as you'll get to understand why I say it cost it, it, it was actually a cost of four years to my trading career. Because only in 20 in 2021 did I actually come to learn fundamentals with the objective of mastery, not with the objective of knowing, because at that in 2017, I thought I knew. Uh, what I was doing when it comes to fundamentals. But in this case, I was like, okay, I'm trying to achieve mastery of this of this specific part of the financial market. And that is what I did, right? But essentially, the reason I'm telling you guys the story here is for you guys to understand that do not make the mistake of assuming you have learned something just because you know about it. Because sometimes the biggest hindrance to actually learning something is you thinking that you know something. So do not make that mistake. If you have an opportunity, take notes down, let whatever you're learning, whatever it's being taught to you to actually sink in, meditate on it, and then be able, and then look forward to actually what? To actually applying it. I think there's even a Bible verse with that talks that speaks about knowledge. Uh, that says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, right? And since they have rejected knowledge, I will reject them. Uh, so it, the, the same principles apply here. When If you're looking to get good at something, you need to do what you need to seek knowledge, seek learning, but do not seek to know about the thing, but to also achieve what? Mastery, mastery which is effortless execution of the thing. So now that I've done that much of talking and I've given you guys a brief summary of my actual trading journey and how it started. I thought about doing a PowerPoint presentation, but I realized, no, it's not my thing. I love doing working with the blackboard here. So now we're going to get started. So how do you then unleash the power of fundamentals? How do you then understand the simplicity of fundamentals? Understanding, and the first thing you need to understand is that when we're trading Forex, we are trading a component of the financial markets, right? It's not the whole thing. It's a component. We have Forex, we have stocks, shares, indices, equities, all of that. So that's the first thing there. So now we need to look at each component separately. So the first framework that we apply is answering three questions. This is the first thing that we need to do. We need to answer three questions. So the, so the first question is, the first question is, what is it, right? So, and I know they, they might not make sense right now, but uh, trust me, they will in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a short period of time once I explain them deeper. And then the second question is, because there's three questions, right? Then the next question is, um, what drives it, right? So, what affects it slash drives it. 
And then the third question is, what affects the drivers? And maybe it might sound silly how I've actually phrased these questions, but it's a way that made it easier for me to actually understand. So the first thing we need to know uh, for us to actually start moving towards the path of effortless execution and fundamentals is understanding what it is. I told you guys, Forex is just a component in the big financial markets or in the bigger scheme of things. So Forex is currencies, right? So the first thing is understanding what is it, right? So if we're looking at currencies, of which we're going to start with currencies. So currencies. Then the next thing will be, what is currency? Or what, what, what is a currency, right? So let's, let's just change the color here. So when it comes to a currency, Let's bring it back to white. So first thing, what is it, right? So it's a system of money, right? In this case, I'll just, you can Google the term if you want the exact term, but I'll just give you terms that made, made it simpler for me to actually understand. It's a system of money. So it's a system of money, right? And uh, okay, let's say used in a particular country. Right, so that's the first thing. That is what a currency is, right? So if it's a system of money, the next question would be who manages the system, right? So who manages the system? So that is where we get to actually answer our second question, which is what affects it or what drives it? So what actually affects or drives this system of money? Who is in, who is the, the, who are the people who manage what? This actual system of money. So in this case, it is, the central banks, so it is the central banks via monetary policy, and government via fiscal policy. Fiscal policy essentially means taxes, right? Government spending and taxes, monetary policy, is, is with regards to, uh, sorry guys. So monetary policy is with regards to interest rates and then using some sort of measures as well to increase or decrease money supply. That is from the side of what? Of central banks, right? So fiscal policy, okay. Sorry guys. Uh, I had to admit someone in the room, so I got a bit distracted there. So fiscal policy. And then, okay, so the second question is, what affects or drives currencies? It is central banks via monetary policy and government via fiscal policy, right? Uh, fiscal policy, not fiscal, fiscal policy. And then the third question to answer is what affects the drivers, right? So in this case, what affects central banks? What affects the government, right? So for them to actually make decisions, for them to what to manage the system, which is a currency. So what actually affects them? So we're looking at economic indicators, uh, economic indicators, such as inflation, interest rates, uh, unemployment. Uh, okay, I'll just read, I'll just write unemployment, uh, consumer confidence. Uh, you name it, GDP, so on and so forth, right? So that is how you 
look at what? This is how you look at currencies. So whenever you're looking to understand currencies, the first thing is to know it is a system of money. That is what it is. And then who controls or manages the system of money? It is central banks via what? Via monetary policy as well as and then governments via fiscal policy. And then we have economic indicators such as inflation, interest rates, unemployment, consumer confidence that actually affect what? The drivers, which is central banks and government, right? To actually make their decisions on how they will manage the system of money. So to go into my into a spreadsheet that we have here on 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 Excel. So this is the spreadsheet that I use for actually tracking uh, all the data, uh, the fundamental data that is. So as you can see, this spreadsheet has what has economic indicators. It has the interest rates, GDP, PMIs, inflation, right? So I won't really go into the much into much details, but essentially interest rates we should all have an idea of what it is. The higher the interest rate, the better, right? Because it means that you are getting more return for your money if you investing that money in that specific economy or in that particular economy, right? And then GDP means growth of the, of the economy, positive number, and the higher the number is, the better it is. Like, as you can see here for the US, the United States dollar, it's currently at 3.2. Then inflation, that 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 is what actually pushes central banks central banks to either increase interest rates or decrease interest rates via monetary policy and as you can see by inflation i have targets here so this is the target so every central bank has a target if inflation is way above their target they need to lower inflation close to their target they all they are all trying to achieve this target whatever their specific target is right so for this specific example we're going to look at the swiss franc so Swiss franc, as you can see here, CHF, their actual target is anywhere between 0 and 2%. That is the target <clears throat> for the Swiss National Bank, which is what this, which is the central bank of Switzerland. So they are the central bank that is responsible for doing what? For managing the system, which is the currency, right? So if I say that when inflation is below their target and dropping, they look to do what? They look to cut interest rates. But if inflation is above their target and increasing, they look to increase interest rates so that they can eventually lower inflation. So when it comes to the Swiss National Bank, if we go on to the actual tab of inflation, keep in mind that their target is 0 to 2%. So if we look at CHF, as you can see here, inflation started dropping from 2023 in June. So as you can see here, in June, this is June 2023, inflation in Switzerland was at 1.7%. So it had dropped from 2.2 to 1.7%. Previously, or previous to that, the Swiss National Bank actually started increasing interest rates in what? In uh, around, around June 2022, and at that point, inflation was at 3.4%. So at, you, as you can see, remember, their target was 2%, but inflation had been increasing since 2021 and, and, and moving forward. And then eventually when it was around 3.4%, which is 1.4% above the 2% target, that is when they started what? Increasing interest rates. And then eventually in, we, we started seeing inflation eventually fall. And another thing to remember is that when they increase interest rates, inflation does not fall immediately. There is a lag effect or it takes some bit of time. They, they will hike interest rates today, but it might take a couple of weeks or months for, to start seeing the effects of the interest rate hikes on the actual economy or inflation. But in this, in this example, inflation started going down. And then eventually, Around June, like I said, 2023, they had started hiking in June 2022. So a year later, inflation had dropped back to their target. It was at 1.7%. Then it continued to drop until where it is right now at 1.2%. So now it is below their target, right? So what was the expectations that we had in the group? It was that since now inflation has been below their target since June 2023, going into 2024, 
it would be appropriate for the central bank to do what? To cut interest rates. Why? Because they are trying to achieve the target of 2%. Remember, that is what they are trying to achieve or to keep inflation as close as possible to their 2% target. When it was above, they were increasing interest rates. Now that it's below, they are cutting interest rates. And like I said, interest rates, the higher it is, the more attractive or the more return on your capital you get. So the lower it is, which means that if a central bank is cutting interest rates, we sell that currency or that economy. But if a central bank is increasing interest rates as investors, we look to what? We look to invest our money with that specific currency. So in this case, for Swiss or for the CHF, we started looking to do what to sell the Swiss, the Swiss, uh, the Swiss currency because we were anticipating, not expecting, or not guaranteed that the Swiss National Bank will actually cut interest rates. But because inflation had already fallen below their target since June 2023, and we are now entering 2024, for that means it was what over six months or six months plus. We were expecting that they will do it. They will cut interest rates so that infl so that inflation does not continue to fall to fall further away from their target. So that was the, the story with the Swiss National Bank, right, and CHF. So the reason I share this with you is so that you have an idea of what I meant when I said that this is how we actually have a simple understanding of fundamentals so now we're gonna go back to our to chrome and actually go back to the actual diagram where we started at so that you can now see how everything sort of ties in together so remember what we said currencies is a system of money and it is managed by central banks so central banks are the drivers of currency central banks as well as governments and then economic indicators such as inflation and interest rates and unemployment, so on and so forth, like I've explained, they actually affect the decisions that central banks and governments make. So with our idea of looking to sell the Swiss, the, the Swiss currency, we then decided that we are going to sell it. And then, of course, we needed to find a suitable another currency to actually sell it against. Because whenever you're trading Forex, you are trading two currencies against each other. You're not only trading one currency, right? So in this, in this, this is when we decided that we are actually going to, we are actually going to sell Swiss against the Australian dollar, as well as the Great British Pound, right? Which is GBP CHF, as well as AUD CHF. So around early, early March, we decided or we had an opportunity to actually buy the pound against the Swiss dollar. And we actually did that, right? Also, I'll go into my spreadsheet shortly to, to also show you another reason why specifically I chose these two currencies, the Swiss, the, the Australian dollar, as well as the pound. So when it comes to the pound, we bought around early March, right? When it comes to Australian, Australian dollar, which is AUDCHF, we actually bought, it was late, 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 late February. Yeah, late February, as you can see, that is when we actually bought AUDCHF, which means that we sold the Swiss franc and the reasons why it is based on what I've explained previously. Everything that I just showed you guys about inflation, that is what led to this decision. This specific decision, that is what led to me actually coming to the conclusion that I'm selling the what? I'm selling the Swiss franc. So these are the two trades that we had. And then, of course, they moved in our favor. We've closed, we've closed a couple of profits. But I'm not just here to show you guys profits or for you guys to focus on the returns. I need you guys to focus on the process. That is what I'm here to teach you guys on, the process of actually doing this, the process of actually what? Applying this, right? So the next, so now we are going to go back to the spreadsheet. So like I said, one of the reasons... <coughs> I actually sold the Swiss franc against the pound as well as the Australian dollar besides some of the economic uh, factors or indicators. It was, if we look at interest rates, remember what I said, the higher the interest rates, the higher the return, which means the lower the interest rates, the lower the return, obviously. So in this case, the Swiss franc has an interest rate or, or they had an interest rate of 1.75, right? 
right? So let's actually go into interest rates. They they had they started hiking, and then eventually their interest rates had reached a peak of one point seven five, right? So this is the Swiss franc line, as you can see. Then, for the for the UK economy, their interest rates are sitting at around five point five, so they are somewhere in this region here. The Australian economy, their interest rates are sitting at 4.35, so they are also somewhere in the region here. So as you can clearly see, there was a gap between the 1.75% of Swiss and the 4.35% of the Australian dollar and the 5.5% of what? Of the Great British Pound. Of the Great British Pound, sorry guys, or GBP. So what that meant is that if I am buying a higher interest rate currency, GBP or Australia, against a lower interest rate currency, CHF, mm -hmm. there is a difference in the interest rates and that we call the interest rate spread. How many of you guys, uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you've experienced this, but how many of you guys have actually executed a trade or opened a position, held it for a couple of days, but when you looked at your swap, you saw that you were actually accumulating a negative swap. How many of you have, have experienced that? Okay, which means that none of you guys are, are swing trading. So that is my assumption. But the reason you would you'd be getting charged a negative swap by your broker, it is because you are on the, I'll, I'll say this blatantly, you are on the wrong side of interest rates. What that means is that you as an investor, you've taken your money, you've invested your money in a currency with a lower interest rate against a currency with a higher interest rate. So you would have been doing the opposite of what I did to GBPCHF and AUDCHF which means you would have bought Swiss franc and sold the pound or sold the Australian dollar. So that is why you are accumulating a negative swap every single night for holding your position. But if you understand interest rates like I do or like I'm showing you right now, then you will try as much as possible whenever you're looking to trade Forex currencies to buy, a. if you're looking to buy, you want to, try as much as possible to buy a currency with a higher interest rate against a currency with a what? With a lower interest rate, like we did in the examples that I'm showing you. Because of the difference in this in the interest rates, the broker is going to pay me a positive swap. So in as much as those trades are going in my, in my favor, I'm earning pips, I'm also getting an interest payment for my, from my broker every single night for holding the position. So that is the beauty of swing trading and understanding fundamentals or essentially interest rates because you're getting paid twice for just holding the position and being on the right side of interest rate. The broker will pay, will start paying you every single night because you are an investor. At the end of the day, you are an investor. So what you've just did, you've just taken your money and invested it in a higher interest rate currency against a currency with a lower interest rate. And then your money needs to work for you. And that is why the broker pays you interest. For what? For being on the right side of interest rate. So besides those two trades actually going in our direction, they are also paying us interest, which is why, like you saw, they are actually pulling back right now. But I am still holding because the longer I hold, the more interest I am getting, which is why I presume or I think because I'm I'm not a, a an institutional trader but this is the reason why I think some large institutions are able to hold positions for months or years why because they know that they are getting an interest payment and it's called a carry trade when it comes to the forex lingo of it but they are getting an interest payment every single time for doing what for just holding the position right so that is the beauty of understanding currencies from a fundamental perspective and then as you can as you see here interest rates have now dipped from 1.75 to 1.5 so this week uh, on thursday actually which is yesterday uh the swiss national bank actually came out and they gave a surprise cut of interest rates so they came out and they cut interest rates like we had anticipated not expected because we didn't know guaranteed that they would do that but because of of what we understood about inflation 
we anticipated that they, it will eventually come a time when they will have to cut interest rates. And of course, they cut interest rates, and that is why you saw, you saw as you saw in the, on, 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 on the actual chart examples, GBPCHF and AUDCHF spike higher, right? So that is the first part or the first component of the financial markets, currencies, right? So for you to understand currencies or for things to be much more simpler, when it comes to currencies, you need to answer those three questions, right? And once you are able to answer these three questions and you have laid down your points, whenever you are reading financial news articles, you are looking for these clues. If there's anything that is mentioning inflation getting out of hand, being too high, or inflation being too low, then you know that the likelihood of that specific central bank for that specific economy, if inflation is too low, the most likely option is for them to cut interest rates. So I'd look to sell that economy. If inflation is too high and you're just reading a financial news article and they talk about how high inflation is for that specific economy, you, de you then start taking that as a cue that possibly at some point they are going to do what they are going to increase interest rates. So you can start positioning yourself before it actually happens, right? And that is the power or the simplicity of fundamentals when it comes to currencies. And guys, if you have any questions, like I said, I'll answer questions at the end. Please try and write them down so you don't forget or just type them out in the chat and we'll read everything at the end because I just want to get through the whole lesson before we actually focus on answering questions, right? And then the second component of the financial markets, like I said, currencies are just a component. The second component is... The second component is indices, right? Or equities, yeah, indices. Let's just use indices, right? So by indices or equities, I mean anything like in the US, we have the NASDAQ, we have the Dow Jones, we have the S&P 500, and also the US 200 as well. 2000, sorry, not 200, 2000. Uh, in the UK, we have the UK 100. In Japan, we have the JP 225, I think. And then, yeah, it is that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure of the actual abbreviation of it now. And then in China, we have the China 50, so on and so forth. In, the, in, the, in, Europe, in Europe, we have the German 30, right? Of course, which Germany falls under Europe. So that is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about indices, right? So when it comes to indices, we're going to answer the same questions. It's a different class of what? It's a different class of the financial markets, right? So it's not a class in itself, in, in itself like alone, but it's, a, it's within the financial markets. So first question, right, to answer is, what is it? So what are indices? So how I simply put, or how I simply break down indices, it's a collection of businesses, right? It's a collection of businesses. That is what I, that is my simplest explanation of uh, indices, right? The collection of businesses. So if it is a collection of businesses, what affects businesses, right? So profits, so profits, um, let's say, yeah, let's say, let's say profits, uh, growth uh, or earnings, earnings, right? So let us be more, let us use the lingo of trading, right? So earnings, which is, company earnings, so on and so forth. Uh, also customers, right? Customers, they actually drive the business as well because if the business has no customers, then the business is not in business because how, how, how will the business actually make money if, it's not, if it doesn't have customers and actually gaining a profit, right? Or generating revenue and actually becoming profitable, right? So that is, that is uh, what we have. So what else do we have when it comes to businesses? Um, yeah, let's say, I'd say that's pretty much it in terms of what actually drives businesses. Then we have to answer that third question. What affects the drivers, right? So in this case, what affects profits? What affects earnings? What affects uh, customers, right? So in this case, it would be what we looked, what, what something that we've just recently looked at, which is high, which is interest rates, right? So Let's start negatives. Let, let us look at the negative effects first, right? So negative, right? So let's put it in, in brackets. 
Uh, so high interest rates. So high. So I'll just write rates, guys. So <clears throat> so high rates. That means interest rates. Why are high interest rates negative to businesses? Because it affects customers. Because if interest rates are high, mortgage repayments in terms of interest or maybe loan repayments are now higher. So the, the customers do no longer have disposable income or as much disposable income as they had before interest rates started going higher to actually spend on businesses or spend on whatever they like. So if customers are no longer buying as much as they used to, it affects what? Profit margins of businesses. And even those businesses that actually that have actually taken out loans, they need to now repay those loans at a higher interest payment so it is what it is squeezing on the profit margins of those businesses. So that is why high interest rates are actually a negative for businesses, right? Then another thing that we have that is a, a, a negative, it is obviously a recession. Uh, yeah, I'd say let's, let's just leave it at that for now. And then a positive in terms of positive things that actually affects these drivers or that affects profits, earnings, and customers, it is actually <clears throat> it is actually the opposite of what we've just done right now, which is low interest rates. So low rates and then as well as uh, expansion, right? Which is the opposite of what? Which is the opposite of recession, right? Because if, if there's expansion, the economy is doing well, it's booming which means that businesses are growing, they're expanding, they're hiring more people, unemployment is going low. And then, of course, that will also lead to what? That will also lead to high inflation. So another thing to remember is that expansion or growth comes with high inflation. Why? Because inflation is produced by an increase in the demand of goods and services. If more people have money, that means that now there's more money chasing a limited supply of goods because more people are getting employed because businesses are growing and expanding in the expansion phase so that more people now, sorry about that. I just had to let someone come again. Uh, where was I? Okay, back to, back to expansion. So since businesses are expanding and growing so much, they need what? They need more manpower or more labor. So they're hiring more people. So now it means that at the end of the month or at the end of the week, more people are now getting paid a salary. So that means that now more people have the what? The privilege of actually going into a store and actually demanding a good, a good or a service, right? So that means that now the, the demand of goods and services increases. And since now the demand of goods and services increases because more people are getting paid or having or they have money, that means that what? The people who supply the service or who actually supply those goods will actually increase their prices so that they can do what they can meet the demand right so <clears throat> sorry so they will increase their prices because the demand of those services is actually increasing and that is what is inflation or that is what inflation actually is inflation is when prices go up and the reason prices go up it is because there is a huge demand of that's of those specific what goods and services right so that is why expansion is a positive for businesses because it means they are growing and expanding and then also uh we can also say <clears throat> we can also say high inflation yeah let's say high in, let's say high inflation but for this one no let's not put it in there because at the same time it's also not good for the consumer because it's taxing to the consumer it might be good for the business but it's taxing to the consumer right so when it comes to indices this is the simple understanding of indices, right? Or equities. It is a collection of businesses. So if it's a collection of businesses, we need to understand what affects businesses or what drives businesses, profits, earnings, and customers, right? What affects profits, earnings, and customers? The negative effects, it's high interest rates and a recession. Of course, in a recession, it means that it's the opposite of everything that I explained in an expansion, which means that what? Businesses are laying off more people. They are retrenching more people, which means that unemployment is going higher. And if unemployment is going higher, eventually inflation will also go down, right? Why? Because not as many people can now afford or have the privilege to actually afford a basic good or a service, right? So which means that demand of goods and services will go lower, 
which is why it is negative, right? And if customers are not spending or if people, consumers are not spending, then businesses have no money, right? So that is why it is negative for businesses whenever there's high interest rates and a recession and then positive whenever there's low interest rates and a what? And an expansion, which obviously would lead to high inflation. So going into the example of now indices, like we did with currencies, just a quick one because this is actually taking way longer than I thought it would. Uh, are you guys still okay? Am I, are you still following or am I moving too fast or too slow? I'm holding on tight. Sorry? It's good. It's still good. It's still good. Okay. <laughs> Let me know if I'm moving too fast or too slow. I feel like I'm moving too slow. Maybe it's because I'm teaching, but if you guys are still good, then I'm also good, right? So we're going to go back to our spreadsheet here. And then remember, we said that uh, it is high interest rates as well as what? As well as inflation. That has an effect on what? That has an effect on indices. Not, not to say that is the only thing, but I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible for everyone to actually understand where I'm coming at, right? Of course, you need to actually dig a bit deeper to actually uncover more. But this, if you understand this, this will actually set you in the right path of achieving what we said earlier on, which is mastery, right? Not just to know it, but to also be able to execute it effortlessly. So in terms of indices, as an example, we're going to look at interest rates. But before we get to interest rates, remember I said for interest rates to either go up or go lower, inflation needs to be taken into consideration, right? So we're going to go into the master tab and then we're going to look at the United States dollar. So where is the USD? So here's the USD here. As you can see, when it comes to the United States dollar, the target for inflation is 2%, right? So which means that if it's way above 2%, they are, the Fed, which is the central bank of the United States, they're more likely to increase interest rates. If it's way below 2%, they are more likely to cut interest rates so that it can eventually what? boost inflation. Remember what I said, in a recession, to get out of it, they need to cut interest rates and that will boost what? Spending. So that will also lead to growth of the economy. So whenever inflation is way below target, 2%, they are going to cut interest rates to try and stimulate it because the objective or the central bank is mandated. It is their job. I need you guys to view the central bank like this. Okay, how I view them, I if you can try and view them in the same light, there are nine to five workers. So central banks, they look at them as nine to five workers. Why do I say that? Because they are employed to make sure that the economy is running smoothly, inflation is stable, and the economy is growing gradually over time. So that is why I say they are, they are, they are nine to five workers. So that means that they will not wake up one morning and decide that they are going to, excuse my French, fuck everything up and no longer provide for their families or no longer put food on the table for their families by making irrational or uninformed decisions, right? So that is the importance of central banks in the whole financial markets because they are mandated and they are employed by the government or by that specific country to run the economy. Right. So they, 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 they have a very huge responsibility. So which is why I like to pay so much attention to them, what they think, what they are looking at, because it will also give me an idea of what to look at and what to expect. Right. So that I just needed to throw that one in there. So 2% target for the United States dollar. Let's go to the inflation tab here real quick. Let us see uh, United States inflation. It peaked. At around, okay, later, when, when did it actually go above the 2% target, right? So in March 2021, as you can see here, in March 2021, this is the United States uh, column here. So in March 2021, that is when headline inflation jumped to 2.6%. But in April 2021, that is when core inflation actually jumped to 3%, right? So uh, I won't really get much into the difference between the two inflations, but essentially, Headline inflation takes into account everything. Core inflation excludes what? 
volatile products or volatile components such as food as well as um as well as energy prices which is oil prices because they fluctuate a lot right so that is the diff essentially the basic difference between the two so in the us april 2021 that is when we saw inflation jump above their two percent target right so that let us say that is when the actual trend started so i came to know about fundamentals in 2021 around july right so at that point Inflation was sitting at 5.4%, or way, yeah, more than double the, the target of 2%. So what did this start telling me at this point, right? If you've been paying attention to what I was explaining with the Swiss uh, on, in the first example using currencies, what this started telling me is that the Fed will eventually start increasing interest rates to try and lower inflation because inflation is now more than double their 2% target, which means that inflation will probably start getting out of hand. That was the conclusion that I came to. And then from there, I started looking to buy the dollar, right? In, in around, let's say, September, right? So around August, September, that is when I started looking to buy the dollar in 2021 because of inflation. I just needed to throw that one out there. But because we are looking at an example of indices, inflation started going higher and higher and higher, right? And then eventually, in uh, around uh, November 2021, December 2021, the Federal Reserve actually came out and said that they will no longer be employing measures uh, on the monetary side that would uh, that that continue to stimulate the economy or increase the supply of money in the economy. They will start in, in applying uh, measures that actually decrease the supply of money in this in that case which was they would reduce actually buying bonds uh, and then they would eventually get to a point where they look to actually start selling bonds right and then eventually that meant that they were they were also looking to do what to increase interest rates right so if they are looking to increase interest rates because now inflation is way above their target it's sitting at seven percent their target is two percent what did that mean for indices if you paid attention to the to, to my explanation of indices if in if inflation is high or if central banks are increasing interest rates or if interest rates are high it is what it is a negative effect to watch two businesses. So if it is a negative effect to businesses and we understand that businesses or that indices are actually a collection, if indices are actually a collection of businesses and high interest rates have a negative effect on businesses, that means that indices are expected to do what to go lower if, if central banks are starting to hike interest rates or they are increasing interest rates, right? So that was the idea or the thought process that we have just because we under, we were able to answer these simple three questions. So when it came to the actual chart of which I did not actually have a trade on, so I did not mm -hmm. sell the indices, but I'll actually show you guys what I meant. Remember, that was around the end of 2020, uh, that was around the end of 2021, heading into 2022. So this is the S&P 500. As you can see, this right here, this was the end of 2021, right? 2022, 2023, and then we're currently we're in 2024. So look at what happened in the beginning of 2022, or let's say almost the whole of 2022, indices went lower. Why? Because of what I've just explained earlier, that if interest rates are going up, they are not they are a negative effect to businesses and consumers and businesses and consumers or oh, sorry and prof, profits and consumers actually drive businesses so it means that businesses will be negatively affected by high interest rates so it means since indices are a collection of businesses because that is essentially what they are that means that if businesses are not doing well or not expected to do well because of interest rates going up indices should also fall that is how simple it is, guys. So this, this is what I mean by the simplicity of fundamentals. If you actually get to understand them or try and understand them rather than just knowing about them, right? So this was the anticipation. And that is why we saw indices actually fall for, most, for the most part of 2022. But then they bottomed out around October and then they started going up since. So what had changed, right? So prob most probably... What, what what had actually triggered the sell-off 
had actually reversed. Maybe now the central banks were cutting interest rates. I don't know, but let's see. Let's actually look at our, at our spreadsheet to actually get an idea of what was happening. So that was around October, 2022. So now if we go up uh, to October, 2022, this is where we are at. So inflation was now at 7.7% headline, core inflation at 6.3, still way above the central bank targets, right? But around June 2022, inflation had peaked at 9.1%. And in March 2022, when inflation was at 8.3%, that is when the Fed, the Federal Reserve, actually started doing what? Started increasing interest rates. So we're going to quickly go onto the interest rates tab to actually see what I'm talking about. So they actually started increasing interest rates in March 2022. So if we go into March 2022, as you can see here, interest rates in the United States were actually sitting at 0 0.25 for the longest of time, right? As you can see, 2021. Then they started increasing them 0 0.5, 0, and then eventually where they sit today at 5.5%. But they had actually increased, started increasing in March 2022, and they continued to increase. So when indices started bouncing higher, interest rates were still going up. So why did indices go up at that point? Because I said that if interest rates are high, it is negative for indices. They should continue going lower. Well, it goes back to what? It goes back to inflation. And then another understanding that markets are forward looking. Right. So like I said, October 2022, inflation was at 7.7. .7. It had peaked at 9.1%. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when I spoke about interest rates earlier, remember I said they do not hike interest rates today and they see the effects of interest rates tomorrow or even today. So there is a lagging effect. So after they had initiated an interest rate in, or they had initiated the interest rate hiking cycle in March 2022, what happened? Inflation went up until 9.1 in June 2022, and then the trend started going lower from there, as you can see. Now the month to month was now giving what? A lower print than the previous month. So what did that give a, a, an assumption of? The fact that what? The fact that now the Fed, now interest rates are starting to work on the economy, so they will relieve the pressure on businesses when interest rates eventually start falling. So that was the whole idea there because we had three months of, of, of downward GDP, of down, downward inflation prints. So three months or three prints is a trend. That is how we a trend is established. Once you have three prints, it's a trend. If you have one, then you can say maybe it was just a one hit wonder. But if there's three, then it's like, okay, there's a trend that's potentially forming there. So at that point, that is when there was what? There was that ease of the pressure from businesses of because interest rates were high. Not to say the Fed had started cutting interest rates. No, interest rates were still going up and they were still relatively high. But because inflation was showing signs of slowing, even though it was still way above 2%, that is when market participants were like, okay, we can probably... The Fed will eventually cut interest rates because no one, no, no one was sure of how much or how big inflation would fall. No one knew that it would be falling from 7.7 .7 to 7.1. Maybe it would fall off the cliff the next the next month, you know? So just 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 the thinking there. So that is why in October, even though interest rates were still going up, but in October 2022. That is when we saw the bottoming out of what? Of indices. And then, of course, they started going higher. The economy, the U.S. economy was also doing good GDP-wise, growth-wise. So things just, just started going higher. And remember what I said, expansion is good as well. So GDP was, was showing good signs. Everything else was just showing good signs. Unemployment was, unemployment was relatively low. So all of this, those things were showing good signs or the signs of an economy that is expanding. And of course, inflation now starting to fall. That was the consensus there. And then eventually, I stuck. Uh, guys, can you still hear me? Starting to break up a little bit, but still with you. Uh, okay. Uh,
okay, maybe maybe my network is a bit unstable. Am I am I clear now? Yep, you are loud and clear. Okay, okay, good. So, what was I saying? Okay, I was still on the on the aspect that okay. So from that point, July or October twenty twenty two, that is when markets optimism started increasing, right? Because not because the Fed was had had started cutting interest rates, no, but because they saw that there was light at the end of the tunnel, right? The because remember, the more interest rates go higher the the higher the chances of a recession so the more interest rates go higher the chances of a recession also increase because what what are interest rates doing they are slowing down the economy so that was the that was the prospect and then eventually around october 2023 when i actually also got in the wave and i started and i bought s p 500 and i've been holding since that is when inflation had fallen to the ranges of 4%. I'm not going to go back to the spreadsheet now because I feel this this is also taking longer. <laughs> but they actually that is when inflation was around 4%, not yet at the 2% target, but headed in the right direction. Right. So that is when market optimism had shifted and then they were expecting a soft landing because growth was still good, inflation interest rates were high, but the economy was still resilient and all of that, right? So that is when I also jumped in the wave and I bought S&P 500 and I've been holding since then, right? And of course, it still keeps on pushing higher because Fed is now talking of the prospects of cutting interest rates, not anytime soon, obviously, but sometime this year, they are looking to cut interest rates. So that is how you actually approach indices or that is how i would have advised you to approach indices yeah let me say advise you to approach indices from a fundamental standpoint because now if you have an understanding of the of the factors that affect the drivers of indices or the drivers of businesses whenever you're reading articles that are talking about interest rates going higher recession expansion so on and so forth you now have an idea of how it could potentially affect indices moving forward right was that one clear yes yes it was okay then the next component of the actual financial markets because like i said we're just gonna look at most yeah let's they will look at the most mostly traded components right so the next component is actually Oil. Now let's say commodities, right? Let's say commodities. Uh, but okay, let's let's separate it into two rather than to group it together. So let's say oil. Let's look at it separately. Oil, and then we'll look at gold as well, separately, right? So oil, approaching the same or using the same framework, right? The same uh, three 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 questions framework, right? So when it comes to oil, firstly, what is oil? So how I like to classify oil it's a commodity that keeps the world moving right so oil commodity that keeps the world moving uh, so if it's a commodity I should have put two m there uh, forgive my ocd guys i could have just ignored that but yeah, commodity that keeps the world moving. So that's the, that's that's essentially what it is, right? It's used in petrol, it's used in transportation and a lot of things, right? So it's that is what it is. It keeps the world moving. That's just how I simply explain oil. So what affects so or what drives oil? Supply and demand, right? So in this case, supply and demand. If there's a if there's a if there's expansion growth happening that increases the demand of oil because people are moving about, things are being transported, right? So on and so forth. So oil demand increases, right? But if there's no, there's a recession or not that much of an expansion, then, excuse me, demand goes lower for oil. And then you'd have that affects the oil price as well. Then to answer the third question would be, uh, someone actually posted in the chat, uh, um yeah I'll, 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 if 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 you have me on someone just typed on on the chat sorry about that guys 
uh, if you have me on, on Instagram or any socials, just send me a message there so that I know that it's you. Yeah, but I'll, I'll make a plan to, to actually have the webinar available. Not sure how I will actually have it available now or what vehicle I will use, but I will. So uh, the next, so supply and demand. Then I was on question number three, how do we actually, or what are the drivers or what affects the drivers to be exact of supply and demand? In this case, with regards to oil. So like I had said, it's recessions, right? So negative, negative effects, it's recessions. So recessions, right? Um, what else could affect oil negatively, right? Recessions, essentially recession covers the scope of decrease in or a decline in, glo in global growth. Uh, geopolitics, geopolitics, yeah, they can have a negative effect or war. Let's say, yeah, geopolitics, they can have a negative, negative effect, geopolitics. And then another thing would be, uh, yeah, let's keep it at that for the negative. And then let's say positive. Positive. Positive, it's actually the opposite of this. So positive, it would be expansion. So expansion, I mean growth. Just remember that. So if there's positive growth, like I said, then people are moving, stuff is moving around. So it's going to need oil, right? Yes, there are electric vehicles now, but for the time being, we are still going to need oil, right? So that is where oil comes in when there's expansion. And then sometimes as well, when there's geopolitics, right? Or geopolitics in in this specific, uh, on like in the particular scenario, example is uh, the war in between Hamas and Israel. Let's say the Middle East tensions that has a positive effect on oil, even though, even though it will affect Oils, well, oil, what oil? Uh, even though it will affect the economy negatively, but it is a positive for oil when it comes to the war, right? Specifically, the war in 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 the Middle East because it is disrupting the supply of oil, so it it, it will obviously leave what demand elevated. So I just needed to throw that one there. So that is what we know. Well, that is what we understand about oil, right? So that means that when we are now looking to trade oil, we also need to focus on those things, geopolitics, recessions. Whenever we, we're reading news articles or financial articles and they are talking about all of these things, how it will affect the supply, of the supply and demand of oil or there's a looming recession, then we need to know, okay, this will have this type of impact or this sort of impact on oil prices right so now we're gonna go back to our chart examples in this case we're not gonna go back to uh the spreadsheet we're actually go gonna go straight into a chart we're gonna look at oil right so we're gonna look at oil and then of course take into account what i said that whenever it's recessions it's uh it's negative for oil right Whenever it's recessions, it's negative for oil, right? So this is 2020, right? So this is 2020. We have we had what? We had the COVID recession, right? And then what happened? We saw, well, when there was a COVID recession, there were what? There were lockdowns. So if there's lockdowns, nothing is moving. So if nothing is moving and the commodity that keeps the world moving is no longer needed, it means the price of that commodity will go lower because it's no longer needed. And that is why we saw oil sh shoot down, well, this is Brent crude, but uh, when it comes to uh, light crude oil, that actually shot down all the way to zero, right? Because there was no longer demand for it because the whole, everything had stopped moving essentially. Yeah, there were some things that were moving the essential workers, but most of the things had stopped <coughs> moving at that point. So that is how you would have anticipated that when there was actually lockdowns, right? And then of course, things started clearing up and then we saw prices go higher after that. And then, of course, we've had other factors that caused or resulted in a decrease of prices, but we've been looking to buy to buy oil since the what? Since the war erupted or broke out in, in uh, October 2023. We've been looking to buy oil. Why? Because, like I explained, the geopolitic, the, the Middle East tensions will affect the supply of oil and it will cause a disruption on the supply of oil. 
especially when the 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 Houthis started uh, disrupting the traveling of uh, maritime vessels in the Red Sea, of which some were carrying oil, so they had to either stop using that route or even turn back, which would obviously increase costs, so on and so forth. But essentially, it disrupted the supply of oil. So if it's disrupting disrupting the supply of oil, it means that demand not that it will elevate, but demand will remain at a higher level because supply is being disrupted. So there is a what a positive for oil. So that is why, <clears throat> sorry, we've been looking to buy oil since October, uh, which is somewhere around here. Yeah, somewhere this month, somewhere around here, October. But oil prices kept on falling. <clears throat> and then we eventually had an opportunity to buy oil. So that is why or one of the reasons or the way of thinking behind why we actually have a buy position on oil, right? So that is just a quick summary when it comes to how you approach oil. And then the next piece that we'll actually look at is gold. It's also a commodity, but in this case, it's gold, right? So we have gold. Uh, you guys still following though? Is everyone still following? Okay. No following. Okay, no, no. Thank you, thank you. Uh when I'm the only one doing the talking, sometimes I feel as if I'm just talking to myself. So I just needed to make sure that everyone is still awake. No one is fast asleep. So, so we're now going to look at gold. And then, of course, we're still going to adopt the very same framework. We're going to answer those very same three questions. The first question being, the first question being, of, of course, what is gold? So gold is a safe haven asset, right? So it's a, okay. So gold is a safe haven assets, right? Uh, it's also a hedge against high inflation. So it's also a hedge against high inflation and it's also a storage of value, right? <clears throat> so that is what gold is, storage of value. So that is what gold is essentially, right? And then second question would be, okay, what affects this safe haven asset? What affects this storage of value? Uh, then of course, supply and demand as well, because it's a commodity, supply and demand, <clears throat> right? And then of course, what affects the supply and demand of gold? Then Similar to most uh, financial market assets, we have uh, recessions. Uh, in this case, since it's also used as a hedge against high inflation, so let's say positive, right? Positive, it's high inflation. So high, high inflation is a positive. Uh, and then we also have um, a weaker USD. So a weaker US dollar because gold, you do have gold that is paired against the Euro or the pound. But in this case, I'm just referring to XAU USD, uh, which is paired against the dollar. So a weaker USD, that's a positive for gold. And then <clears throat> also global uncertainty, right? <clears throat> global uncertainty. Let me have a sip of water. I've been talking for a very long time. I'm not used to talking this much. Uh, global uncertainty is also a positive for gold. Why? Because I said it's a safe haven asset. What is a safe haven asset when, when, excuse my French, once again, when shit hits the fan, investors flock their capital to what? To safe haven assets because they're looking to preserve whatever gains they've made or they're looking to preserve their capital. So that is why we have what? We have 
gold as a safe haven asset. And when there's global uncertainty or pessimism, let's use a, another word that explains it better, pessimism. Pessimism. Okay, I'm not sure if I spelled this correctly, but it is what it is. Pessimism. So if the outlook is not so bright, uh, then or the outlook is sour, then it is a positive for gold. And then, of course, a negative for gold would be the opposite of mostly the stronger US dollar. So let me write it out again. Negative would obviously be a stronger dollar. So stronger USD. <clears throat> uh, we can also say higher interest rates, higher, higher rates. Yeah, or higher rates are also not that positive for, for the fall for gold. And the reason being, if it's paid against the dollar, if investors, if let's say it's not a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position where the outlook is so bad or not so good, if, if the outlook is good, then higher interest rates would result in investors putting their money where they'll get a higher return. So instead of parking their money in gold, that does not give a return. It's only just a storage of value. They'll opt to go with the United States dollar. So that is why higher rates also have a negative effect on gold, right? So yeah, we'll just sum it up then. Obviously, some of the opposites of the positive effect. So that is how we actually have, or that is how we now have an, a simple or simplified understanding of gold based on those three questions, right? And then if we go on to the chart example, we won't be going into, so we won't be going into um, the spreadsheet for this one as well. So let us look for gold. So <coughs> USD, right? So if you look at gold, so when, like I said, whenever there's, the outlook is not so good, like I said, the wars, geopolitics, all of that, they have a what they have they don't have a positive effect so which means that the outlook becomes not so positive and that would benefit instruments like gold that are considered a safe haven right so most recent example when the war broke out in october in october last year we saw what we saw a rally on gold because investors started what flooding their capital into gold because of uncertain times ahead, because of this war that is breaking out in the Middle East and how big it could get, nobody knew at that point, how long it would take, nobody knew at that point. And oh, but nobody even knows till now how long it will take. But essentially, that is that is how that that is how we, we actually approach it, right? So outlook was not good because of the war that was going on. Then we saw gold rally, right? We can even look at some of the recessions that we've had, right? COVID 2020, price dropped and then it rallied most of 2020, right? So that is how you also look to trade gold. That is how you also approach what trading gold as a commodity. In this case, I only traded silver or we only traded silver. And the approach was almost similar because silver mimics gold to a certain extent. That is why we also have a buy position on gold, right? So that actually brings us to the end. I know I've said a mouthful. Uh, well, according to me, I think I've said a mouthful, but that actually brings us to the end of actually how we actually get to understand fundamentals and then use them to swing trade, right? Because we need to be able to answer these three questions. And then whenever we have an understanding or the answers to these three questions, we can then go out every single day. Mm -hmm. If we're reading new financial news articles or we or watching Bloomberg, whatever it may be, then we can do what? Then we can be able to make informed decisions. But if you're seeing that it's talking about geopolitics, recession, you then have an idea of how it that could potentially affect currencies, indices, oil, gold. For currencies, it's more specific. If it's uh if it's a recession in the US economy, if it's a recession in the for the for the European economy, then you know it's affecting the US or the or the USD or the US dollar or the European uh the 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 euro dollar, which is the obviously the European currency, right? So currencies are slightly more specific, but 
if you have that understanding in mind of these factors, then everything else becomes simpler for you when you start what? When you start approaching, uh, when you start approaching the markets from the standpoint of having this knowledge right here, right? So now what we're gonna do is obviously go through some statistics of uh, approaching the markets in this way or in this manner uh, and some and some of the downsides of it and also some of the benefits of it, right? So I'm now going to uh, open. Okay, if this can actually exit. Okay. So now I'm going to open statistics. Okay, I'm not sure why this is now acting all funny. But uh, uh, every everything that I've covered so far, is it clear? While I'm still waiting for my actual statistics to open up. You can unmute yourself or you can type in the chat if you don't wanna speak. So far, so good. Once we get to the questions portion, uh, I don't know, some stuff on it. Uh, uh, okay, so just actually waiting for, not sure why it's taking forever, just waiting for my statistics to actually show up here. Should be here any minute from now. It should open any minute from now. Okay. Okay, so this is based on some of the positions we've obviously executed. And uh, this is where we actually track all our positions, our trades. Let's actually do this. Let's make this into full screen as well so that it can be easier to actually view. Yeah. So this is this is the statistics that we have here. We're not going to dive deep into them because like I said, I'm not just, I don't want you guys to focus on the returns. Uh, mostly so, I want you guys to focus on the process because if you lay down the process, if you have an understanding of the process, then the returns will be there. You will get the returns, right? So essentially, uh, of course, I track everything from my commission, the swaps. As you can see, some of the swaps are positive because I was on the right side of interest rates. Some of the swaps are negative because I was on the wrong side of interest rates, right? So just to also explain or give you guys an understanding of what I meant, by the swap being positive or negative. And then of course, these, this is the PNL of my, of, my, of my trading so far in 2024. And this, guys, the risk here is insane. So this is not with minimal risk. The risk here is insane. As you can see, a losing position can be close to 10%, a 10% loss, right? But of course I know if I, cause I'm swing trading, if I'm winning, I'm winning big. So just to put that out there, don't look at the returns and think that this is a low risk return. This is was a low risk account. No, the risk is pretty high. And then of course, on the side here, we just have, uh, we just have a diagram showing the cumulative, uh, the cumulative profits of the actual portfolio. And then up on top here, as you can see the trading costs, which of course are accounting for the transaction costs, which is the commission that the broker charges me as well as the swaps. <clears throat> Can you hear me guys? Am I still audible? Can hear you fine. Okay. So, so sorry about that. So that is what we have there. So that is the trading cost. And then the total, of course, it's the total of the PL side of things that we have here in dollar. And then this is the percentage wise. And then that puts everything together, gives us the net. And then of course, then the portfolio, 
in terms of the portfolio and the return on capital when it comes to, to the portfolio. So this, this is the spreadsheet that I actually use to track all my positions that I've executed so far in 2024. And of course, this is all based on fundamentals, right? By saying based on fundamentals, I get the trade ideas, I generate the trade ideas from fundamental or from an understanding of fundamentals based on everything that I've just showed you guys, based on everything that I've just explained to you guys in this actual, uh, during the first half of this webinar. I know it's been a very long one and I wasn't planning on it to being this long, uh, but yeah, uh, this actually brings us to the end of our webinar and uh, shortly we'll be, I'll be taking, or we'll be actually going into our Q and A session. Uh, but before we actually go there, for those of you guys who would not like the learning to end here or who would not like the learning to actually stop, I actually have an offer for you guys. So uh, based on the coaching programs that I do offer, for those who, like I said, would not like the learning to stop here, that want to progress further and eventually get closer to that point of uh, effortless execution when it comes to fundamentals, I have an offer for you guys. And uh, that offer includes access to the actual spreadsheets that I showed you guys, the fundamental spreadsheets, and then of course, the where you are able to track your trades. And if I quickly go on to the website here, where I actually have, uh, okay, let's do this. I think it will be easier if I open it up here, it will be much more quicker. So on my actual website, that is where I have all the coaching programs that I do offer. So the difference, not necessarily the difference, but this offer right here, like I said, you have unlimited access to the actual fundamental spreadsheet, right? Because generally there's limited access to the spreadsheet depending on the actual tier of the coaching that you actually choose, right? So. Um, if we just scroll down to the bottom so that I can show you guys what I'm talking about. So, okay, before we even get there, prices will be going up on the 26th of March. For those of you, like I said specifically, who do not want the learning to end here, who like the, the learning to actually progress further and actually make something out of it, uh, prices will be going up on the 26th of March. And when it comes to the actual pricing of the coaching, so we have, I, I actually have three different tiers when it comes to the coaching. So if we can quickly actually get to that. I think, I think my, my, my net is a bit unstable. So these are the four, the three different types of coaching that I have. So this is for four weeks, essentially four weeks is for one month. And generally you have four weeks access to the spreadsheet, right? For 12 weeks, which is three months, you generally have three months, which is 12 weeks access to the spreadsheet. And then for the year or 52 weeks, then you have 52 weeks access to the spreadsheet. But like I said, the offer with this one uh, is that before prices go up, you have unlimited access to the actual fundamental spreadsheet. Obviously, where you get to track your trades, the statistics that you have access, that is for you, for you to track your own trades. But for the fundamental side or for the fundamental spreadsheet side of things, you will have unlimited access. And then obviously when prices go up after the 26th, that is when it will go back to the normal setting where four weeks, four weeks access, 12 weeks, 12 weeks access, right? So I thought I would share that with those of you guys who do not want the learning to end here. And uh, if you'd like to take advantage of that, then you will be most welcome to do so. And then of course, a couple of things to touch over. It includes four hours of coaching per week. So depending on which tier you actually choose, it includes four hours of coaching. It is not a group coaching guys so just to put it out there it's not a group coaching specifically individually and as much as it might be time intensive but i feel that i get to best track everyone's progress or each individual's progress that way and there is and we do not learn things in the same pace or in the same way 
So that is why I structure it this way. And then essentially it just gives you a breakdown of everything that you get to understand or get to learn in the actual or during the actual uh, training, right? So now that I'm through with that offer that I had for you guys, and like I said, for those people and all of you guys here are smart enough to know if something is for you or if it's not for you. And of course, if it's not for you, you won't buy it. If it is for you, you will buy it. But either way, I celebrate whatever decision you've made because for you coming here, I know that you've actually learned something today and you've actually taken something away from today's session, right? And of course, like I said, now we're going to go back to the actual Okay, okay, Tabo has responded, he's good. Doesn't have any questions. Uh, and all the other all the other guys that are still in the call, any questions? Uh yes, just a couple I had jotted down here. Yeah. So just to make sure I have a good understanding. The like the higher the spread between the interest rates of the currencies, so one in the high interest and low interest, kind of the better the trade, the more you're able to carry the trade overnight. So you kind of just get paid for the interest rates. Yep. Yes. One hundred percent. Okay. And then, uh, obviously, it'd be whatever whatever currencies are paired with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, you explain the other commodities. So with mastery. Uh, what was kind of your framework to build mastery? Just repetition over and over again. Yeah, it was. Or yeah, was it, was, any... it was. It was essentially repetition, but mostly it was just simplifying it, like trying to understand what it is that you're actually trading, right? To not not just to know about it that I'm trading forex or currencies. What is currencies? Have that deep level of understanding of breaking it down what is currencies what actually affects currencies because if i if i have an understanding that i'm trading the financial markets and the financial markets has different investment classes it has indices equities so on and so forth which means that they are not the same they might be affected by similar uh drivers or, or factors but they are not the same so i needed to understand each individually what affects it, what affects it positively, negatively, what drives it, so on and so forth. So it was a repetition, but repetition from that angle or perspective, not just repetition for just learning about it, but understanding specifically what I am looking to trade or what I'm looking to invest in. Okay, gotcha. And then, so, so I get the fundamental piece. Do you still use technicals at all? For your kind of like entries and exits, definitely. Or def your specific trip? definitely. Okay. I still I still use technical. So how it works is, or how I've actually structured it, I'd say eighty percent is more of uh, is more of uh, fundamentals, and then technicals is for the entries. Because when I go into the technical chart, I already know my direction or the direction I'm looking to take. So when I go to the technical chart, I'm using a technical chart as a filter. So that I can time my entry, whether it's now the right time to 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 buy or to sell, and of course to wait for a pullback. So that is I, that is what I mean when I say I'm using the technical side, the technical chart as a filter, right? <clears throat> Are we at a level, a cheap level where I'm looking to buy at? Are we at an expensive level where I'm looking to sell at? All of those things. So I still use technical analysis 100%. Just that now, not as much as I used to uh, before actually. Uh, diving deep into fundamentals. Gotcha. Then, so right now I mainly do like options trading for some indices and in some major yep. US companies like Microsoft and stuff. What, what correlation have you seen between, let's say uh, the inflation and then like one of the major, major companies on an index? Or just uh, in the U.S. Well, in terms in terms of uh, since I don't specifically trade like individual shares or companies, I focus more on the indices. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. when it comes when it comes to inflation, it's just for me, it's always the same framework. 
if it's inflation, if it's high, then what is the central bank going to do? Because whatever the central the central bank does, that is what will affect what the actual businesses, right, or the actual companies uh, that form that specific indice. So that is the approach that I have, because I don't really trade individual uh, companies, okay. companies or shares, right? So. Okay, gotcha. All right, I think that was uh, all I had. Didn't mean to take up time for any, anybody else. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Anyway, anyone else with questions? Which means that everyone else is still good. Okay, okay. So I think we'll then, uh, okay. There's someone who actually typed something in the chat. Okay, yeah, I think everything was clear on my side. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Tabani. Thank you for that. So I uh, think since it looks like there's no other questions, uh, I think we'll just have to end our call at this point. And uh, thank you guys once again for actually taking your time because uh, you actually paid with your attention and your time uh, to actually be here. And uh, I hope you actually learned something or you were able to take something away from, from this actual uh, webinar and uh, something that you'll be able to implement it, not just like, remember what I said in the beginning, we're not learning for the objective of knowing. So don't let it be something that you just know, but let it be something that you can be able to effortlessly execute. Right. So I hope after this, you'll be able to take all of this information and then be able to uh, actually implement it and apply it. Is there a package for spreadsheet only? Uh, yes, there is a package for the spreadsheet only. So like I said, with this offer, it comes with it comes with unlimited access to the spreadsheet. But with the previous offers, obviously, after after the duration of it, if it's four weeks after four weeks, you can still access the spreadsheet but it's off, it's obviously at a separate price right it, it, you you have to pay pay separately for it right so you i do have a, a package where you can only have access to the spreadsheet um if you do not mind tabo uh just uh you can contact me either via whichever method that will be more suitable for you whether it's uh, on socials you can send me a dm if it's what or <laughs> email me it also won't be a problem. Or oh, let me just uh, let me just type in my number here at the bottom. You can also WhatsApp me if you want to send me a WhatsApp. Um, yeah, so you can also contact me via WhatsApp just on that on that cell phone number. But I do have uh, a package that is separate where you only have access to the spreadsheet. Obviously. Before that, I'd have to assess that you actually understand because it's pointless for me to give you access to the spreadsheet without you understanding what I have there. So I'd have to assess your understanding and then give you a, 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 a just a simplified breakdown of everything. But as I was saying, uh, thank, thank you guys for actually tuning in and I hope you actually took something away from this, something that you will execute, uh, not just only know uh, and said that, okay, I know about fundamentals and that's it, but be able to implement it, know it, and uh, effortlessly execute it, right? And of course, as always, guys, if, uh, like I said, look, learn to be able to execute it effortlessly. Whenever you're seeking for transformation, that should be your primary objective, right? Always have that hunger and that ability or urge to implement what you learn, right? So that is all I'll just leave you guys with uh, as we wrap up the call. So thank you guys for tuning in and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, have a good one. Thank you, cheers. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you.